As we were about to finish this documentary, another intriguing explanation of UFOs was given to us by an ex-FBI informer, now living in Perth. A research physicist, what he has to say is what he believes to be the truth. It is so staggering, we felt we should extend this program so that he could be heard. This scientist believes that man holds the secret of anti-gravity and can produce flying sources at will. We interviewed him at a private house in Perth. Well, originally I didn't start to uh, investigate UFO phenomena. Um, I suppose I started studying the physics that led me to this point, 62 to um, 64, at the United States Air Force Academy as a cadet in a special government program. As you're aware, the Air Force Academy is outside NORAD in uh, the Colorado Mountains. It's a few miles up the hill from it. And I was trained there with uh, 180 some odd other characters uh, to uh, do research in areas of um, electrogravitics later. And we were programmed with libraries of information by slides flashed up on a wall at the rate of 200 pages a second. We couldn't even read them, but they were being implanted in our minds subliminally. It was a very classified project, and for the most part of it, while we were being programmed, we weren't aware of what was going on. We, we had normal classes in uh, physics and uh, calculus and this sort of things, but this stuff was being programmed in so that we had to assimilate it or bring it to our conscious mind over the months and years that followed in dreams and uh, kind of uh, um, daydream periods during the day when we're awake. But um, I left the academy in 64. I had a top secret security clearance with the government and then eventually that lapsed to secret. And I did a bit of time in the reserves, Air Force Reserves with the Strategic Air Command outside of uh, Fort Worth. And then um, I proceeded to uh, do private research in this electrogravitics and thinking that I had uh, cracked the secret of anti-gravity all by myself and jumping up and down in my father's labs and mines in, in Dallas. And um, one day I was approached by the government uh, in a kind of a an emissary from Dr. Edward Teller's office, uh, Dr. James R. Maxfield. And he told me uh, what I'd been doing in my lab and the details of stuff I haven't even written down or told anybody. He knew. And um, he had other people like myself sponsored in uh, this kind of research around the country. And that was the first time that I knew that the U.S. government was actively involved, had been, and was still actively involved in the uh, control of gravity with electricity. And who did this man represent? Well, his job, uh, as his job qualification is, is he's the director of the James R. Maxfield Radiation Research Clinic in Dallas, Texas. The uh, same Maxfield that uh, invented the irradiated thread treatment uh, for uh, cancer of various organs. Um, if you look at his old dossier that's in the who's who, you find that he was uh, on the president's National Security Advisory Board, which is uh, really a rather important log in the U.S. intelligence system. Um, Kissinger would have been on the same rank. Um, you find that he uh, was closely affiliated with Dr. Edward Teller, who was the um, kind of dubbed the father of the hydrogen bomb project in the United States. But he told me that Dr. Teller was the head of uh, anti-gravity research there, uh, had been, I don't know whether he still is, and that he had worked on a similar project with him. In fact, the uh, letter that you and I uh, viewed uh, earlier from my files from Dr. Maxfield to this government and to Sir John Williams uh, did mention that fact, if you recall. So what happened to you then? Well, um, they suggested that I finish my research in Australia. I uh, wasn't enthralled with the idea, but uh, Dr. Maxfield told me that uh, I would be paid to come down and that uh, I was to call the Australian consulate in um, San Francisco and ask for Bob Gray and tell him that, uh, in these words that I was a member of Maxfield's party. At the same time that uh, I was being approached by Dr. Maxfield's party to come down here and finish my research, I've been approached already by the FBI and was working for them as an informant. That doesn't mean that you're a trained agent. It just means that you're somewhere in industry where they need someone. They don't have time to get them in there. Informing on what? Well, the particular thing I was to inform on was the comings and goings of various people from the White House to my group of companies in uh, Dallas and also their connection to Israel and the Middle East political situation. Um, and I did my job uh, rather well, just reporting who came and went and various uh, amounts of money and things that I didn't know that transferred. Um, 
there were about seven or eight hundred of us uh, in the United States that were um, uh, employed by the FBI in this manner. I didn't take money. I took information in exchange. But um, at any rate, they came and told me, the FBI did, that uh, I'd been compromised uh, by a break-in in one of their agencies in Louisiana or someplace like that, and that I was going to get shot. And uh, which they'd explained to me at the beginning the, the risks involved, but uh, I thought they were joking until I went back to the uh, uh, the office, uh, uh, the computer division there in Dallas, and uh, was sacked, given 30 minutes to clean up my desk and leave, and uh, by an old friend of mine. And so he accused me of being the head of a big spy ring and all kinds of stuff. And so I left. And uh, in fact, I didn't have my last meeting with the FBI, and I didn't have my last meeting with Dr. Maxfield. I just. Uh, Bundled a few things and the family into a plane and uh, headed for Australia. We did make it and I was quite, quite glad to and uh, kept a very low profile for seven months. But I continued to do my research and I wrote Dr. Maxwell a letter and that was perhaps my mistake. I said, look, I've done it. I've figured out the wave uh, equation that we were looking for. And again, in my ignorance, I didn't realize how much work had already been done and gone before me. I was just kind of on the periphery or the edge of this whole development. That's a device to be able to make things like flying saucers fly, mm. is it? Yes. Also, it's a device to store um, energy in the form of motion, uh, like of a uh, a small star or a big atom. It's called, this is a long word, an MHD plasma, magnetohydrodynamic plasma, like ball lightning, and it contains itself. But it's a way to turn all sorts of electricity into a high-voltage battery. Now, this would have been an immediate solution for the Middle East uh, uh, oil blockade at that time. Now, um, I wrote the letter uh, in good faith trying to say, look, we can stop the threat of war in the Middle East by using this as an alternate energy source. It's very portable. It's non-polluting. It had some byproduct radiation problems, but things we could solve. It would be cleaner than fission or fusion. Now, that's when um, people here in this country... Uh, uh, at the aeronautical research labs, uh, politicians started to get a hold of me. ASIO contacted me. Good grief. Uh, an odd infinitum uh, chain of uh, intelligence people, including two CIA people from the States. Uh, and then the FBI eventually started looking for me in this country, and uh, that again was after the intelligence war over there after Hoover died. Um, and I was uh, unable to finish my research in this country. In fact, I met many dead ends in government departments and research facilities where they told me privately, like. Uh, uh, Dr. Tom Keeble in the Aeronautical Research Labs, he told me, yes, we know about the flying saucers your countrymen have built in England and Canada. And, uh, in fact, we have film records of them here in the RAAF uh, files. I, said, uh, I want to stop you there. Yeah. Are you saying, Stan, that there are such things as, let's call them flying saucers, but they are built on Earth? Yes. Uh, that doesn't mean that I um, rule out the possibility of other flying devices or intelligent beings visiting the planet either from uh, the oceanic bottoms or uh, deeper areas or uh, from other areas in space. But I am positive that we have the technology, I can even name the companies and people involved, in making high-speed electric aircraft that do look, strange enough, like a, a saucer. What sort of proof can one furnish for that? Oh, good grief. Uh, the briefcase I've got down here is uh, full of documented evidence that is not all secret. Um, if you go to uh, to the um, the records of the New York Herald Tribune, the newspaper is now defunct. I think it's being stored in the Wisconsin um, State Historical Society. Uh, and look for November 20th, 21st, and 22nd, 1955. There are three articles in the series on uh, anti-gravity and the various companies and people involved in the research of the United States, Japan, Europe. The list is uh, like a who's who of nuclear physics. It was written by Ansel E. Talbert, the science and aviation editor for the New York Herald Tribune at that time. You can look there.